Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Thursday, September 8th edition of the AICPA Town Hall. I hope everyone had a very enjoyable Labor Day weekend as we turn the corner and head into one of our busier times of year. My name is Michael Cerami, and I'll be your host for today's uh, today's town hall, uh, filling in for Eric Auskerson, who will join us uh, later in the month. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome everybody in, and we have a very full agenda for you, full 60 minutes today. Uh, we're gonna start off with our quarterly economic uh, overview uh, with Marcy Rossell, who joins us uh, every 90 days or so. We'll have a brief uh, DC and profession update uh, we'll talk quite a bit about some of the tax and technical updates. And then we'll have open forum and closing remarks. So please do uh, be active in the chat and in the Q and A. Um, again, we have a great list of presenters for you today. We'll be we'll be joined by Ed Carl, who leads uh, the tax area for AICPA, as well as Lisa Simpson, who's going to provide us with a deep technical update, and Marcy Rossell uh, on the economy. So let's jump right in. To the economy, uh, you know, this latest sentiment on the economy from uh, Goldman Sachs suggests that maybe we will, in fact, have a soft landing. Um, I think that's still being debated quite a bit. So I'd like to go ahead and bring in uh, Marcy Rossell. Marcy uh, joins us quarterly for an economic outlook. She's the uh, former chief economist for CNBC, uh, very highly regarded in this area. So Marcy, welcome. It's great to have you back with us today. Uh, it's great to be back, Michael. Thank you so much for having me. It is certainly um, very interesting times for the economy. I, I bet. I mean, that's, I think, probably an understatement. Um, Marcy, we have about 20 minutes or so, so I was thinking maybe we can kind of break the discussion up into, into four, four equal parts or four parts that don't need to be entirely equal. Maybe start off talking a little bit about inflation, um, kind of get your thinking on, on employment uh, and employment numbers. Uh, maybe pivot a little bit to the general economic outlook and then kind of close with some some insights on supply chain, if, if that all makes sense. And I guess I'll kind of get us going um, uh, with, you know, a conversation starter and maybe we begin with inflation. Um, do we think it's coming under control? What are your general kind of thoughts on on status? Well, it looked as if prior to the invasion of Ukraine back in January, February, that inflation should have peaked really about nine months ago. And simply all of the pandemic related issues were sort of beginning to work themselves out. But then we had this massive supply side shock to the global economy that came in the early part of this year when Russia invaded Ukraine and we saw energy prices spike and we saw food prices spike as well. Now, one of the things that appears to have happened is that energy prices, particularly oil prices in the U.S., have come down. And we've seen that sort of flow over into the price of gasoline, which peaked in June and has done something very unusual over the course of the summer, which is go down instead of up. So normally during the summer season, uh, the driving season in particular, when people hit the road, oil, energy prices, particularly gasoline prices, they tend to go up, but they came down over the course of this summer. So it appears as if the headline inflation numbers peaked in June of this year, and we've seen one consecutive month of lower numbers, and we'll get another piece of data next week on the inflation numbers for August. And economists, including myself, um, expect those numbers to be lower, low in the sense of 8% instead of 9%, right? So not a great inflation headline number, but I need people to remember a couple of things. It takes time for two things to happen. It takes time for inflation numbers, the headline number, the year over year number to come down. So even though month over month, um, the inflation numbers are getting better and better, it's a, it's a real lag from year over year before we get back to normal. So I expect this time next year, you should have an inflation number year over year that's probably running 4% or less. Um, and it'll take another year to get us down to the Federal Reserve's target, which is a 2% inflation rate. 
But Michael, I want to remind everyone of this. The Federal Reserve has been raising rates aggressively. They made it very clear at their meeting in Jackson Hole earlier this month that they were committed to getting inflation completely under control. And I believe that all of that talk and action from the Federal Reserve is an effort to basically get them in front of inflation because people had perceived them to be um, the cliche, you know, is behind the curve, right? Everybody says the Fed was behind the curve a year ago. They now find themselves in a position where they have taken strong enough action and they are talking about it in the right way, finally, um, that people believe that they're going to get inflation under control. And if you are of the opinion, like I think many of you were, that um, loose monetary policy causes inflation, and we know that loose monetary policy coupled with really aggressive fiscal policy um, delivered inflation to the U.S. economy for the first time since really the 1980s, then you also have to believe that tight monetary policy will get inflation under control. You can't believe one without the other. So if you think that loose monetary policy was responsible for the inflation, um, then you must also believe that tighter monetary policy will get it under control. And we have tighter monetary policy coming through higher interest rates from the Federal Reserve. So they're making what have come to be known as jumbo increases, where a normal Federal Reserve increase is 25 basis points. They're doing 50 basis points and might even do 75 basis points at their last meeting. We also saw the European Central Bank raise rates this week, and they took the unprecedented step of also raising rates 75 basis points. So you have central banks around the world who are taking steps to tighten monetary policy. And it appears from the behavior of currency markets, where you've got this really strong dollar, if you look at the value of the dollar relative to every other currency on the planet, with the exception of one, and that's the Russian ruble, which is being artificially inflated with capital controls. If you look at all the free floating currencies on the planet, the US dollar has appreciated relative to all of them, which is a strong signal that the Federal Reserve is committed to supporting and protecting the value of the dollar by keeping inflation under control, doing whatever it will take, and currency markets are our strongest signal that it is finally happening. Marcy, if I could interrupt her there real quick. Uh, it, so I think Powell came out again today and kind of once again emphasized that commitment that you're talking about. Do you think this 2% is a real 2%? Uh, you think it's you know a range? Is it they just want to see? I don't know that the Fed would ever come out and, and, and move off of that because just of what it, it you know, how it might be interpreted. But um, What's your general thoughts on it? Is that our true target or it's uh, it's as long as it's moving in that direction? Well, I think as long as it's moving in that direction in a sustained way, I think they're going to be satisfied. But that, again, will take some time. And so don't expect mm -hmm. this to be the last rate increase. I do think you're going to see them probably get it to a level, say, you know, closer to 3%, because that's probably the proper Fed funds target rate for an economy that's going to be growing at about 2%. So I think that they're going to have to take it to 3%. But it wouldn't surprise me if the last couple of increases were back to those normal 25 basis point increases. I expect they'll probably do one more jumbo increase. And once they do that one more jumbo increase, they'll have two months of data. And if those two months of data go their way, then it's possible that they could shift back to 50 basis point increases and then shift down to the 25 basis point increase, which is much more normal and will be their signal to all of us that they're getting comfortable with where things are. Great. Thanks, Mar you, Marcy. Let's let's kind of pivot to uh, to employment numbers. Um, you know, I think. Uh, you know, growth seems to be tempering or slowing. Um, I think when we've talked in the past, one of the things I've appreciated you saying is really the pandemic was an acceleration of what was already in motion. Um, and we definitely have the demographics of not only the U.S., but even, you know, globally of uh, more people, it seems like exiting work than coming into, uh, into work. And so uh, this it would appear to be that this is... Uh, you know, not something that's going to turn around or, or 
correct, it's going to be something we're going to need to live with and manage through. But, you know, curious to get your latest update on on just general employment and, and those trends. Sure. Well, I think the sort of headline might be we're all Japan now, right? We are all entering that phase where people are exiting the labor force very, very quickly. And we could all see that coming. We knew the baby boomers were eventually going to retire. It's just that COVID escalated their retirement from the labor force. So the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis has done some work that suggests that about 2.5 million additional people above and beyond what you would expect retired during the pandemic. And we've talked about this before. So you've got those 2.5 million people that they've moved to Florida and they're probably not going to re-enter the labor force. But because of demographic reasons, we also find ourselves in a situation where that big bubble of millennials is all moving into their 30s and the Gen Z and, and whatever the next generation comes behind them is actually going to be much, much smaller. So you've got fewer young people entering naturally because they simply weren't born. They just don't exist, right? But all of that being said, in the latest unemployment report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, that came out that sort of uh, documented what happened in August, the economy crossed a major milestone in my mind in that there are currently now as many people back employed today as there were prior to the pandemic. That's a real milestone in suggesting that labor markets, just like so many other aspects of our lives, are finally going back to sort of normal pre-pandemic conditions. Now, the unemployment rate, though, is still remarkably low. It ticked up a little bit to 3.7% last month. But part of the reason it ticked up is a lot of folks are now re finally re-entering the labor force. You have kids going back to school, and it looks as if their schooling this time around isn't going to be disrupted by the pandemic. So that was a major factor, keeping moms out of the workforce. So now that you have that consistent child care that's going to come from um, the school year, you can have that generation of moms entering the labor force more confidently, perhaps, than they did last year. So we have labor markets going back to their normal economic conditions, the pre-pandemic conditions. We passed that milestone, like I said, in August. Um, however, you have these long-term trends that were going to happen no matter what. Even without the pandemic, the baby boomers would have eventually retired. It just would have been a little more gradual. And we would have been sort of suffering from the fact that you just don't have as many young people. It's not that they're not working. It's just that they aren't there. They don't exist. And so we find ourselves sort of having to face these long-term challenges that each and every business person out there that you deal with is going to be complaining about, not just this year, not just next year, but indefinitely. This is the world we live in now. It's the biggest long-term challenge that the U.S. economy faces and in any other industrialized country in the world. And Marcy, you've, Marcy, you've covered inflation. We talk now about employment, uh, maybe combine the two. Wage inflation seems to be very real and not something that's you know, going to go away anytime soon. I mean, Talk about that, because, again, it just it seems like, uh, you know, salaries are, are very high and it's going to or at least increasing. And that looks like for the foreseeable future to to want to stick. Yes, I do believe that, that that those salary increases will stick. And part of it is a shifting in the balance of power between workers and employers. You see, in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, the recovery from the financial crisis was delayed. It was like molasses, if you remember it. It took a long time to recover because of the nature of the debt hangover that Americans were all facing. So anytime you have a lot of leverage going into a downturn, one of the, the, the recovery tends to be very slow and very difficult because it takes people a long time to repair their balance sheets and get back to spending money the way they, they did prior to um, the recession. So that recession of 2008-2009 was, was sort of um, was followed by a really re weak and difficult recovery where it was really easy to find workers. Unemployment remained elevated for a really long time. So you could put out a job posting and you get 
decent candidates and a lot of them. But that was a temporary cyclical event. And I think we began to think, hey, this is normally how labor markets are going to be. But as we were going into the pandemic, I suspect that if each and every one of you sort of think back to prior to the pandemic, if you can imagine life before, um, you were struggling to find workers even then. So it was already getting difficult. The balance of power was already shifting. The pandemic came along and just made a couple of things like remote work the new norm, right? So again, shifting the balance in favor of workers as opposed to employers. And rising wages, sort of taking a bigger bite out of profits, I think that that's part of, number one, what the stock market is struggling with right now. Sort of what does the future look like when workers in general are going to capture a larger share of the profit pie than they have over the last about 20 years? And when you couple that um you know, with those all those demographic factors I was talking about, it's a recipe for a much tougher environment for employers. And so as a business person, what do you need to do? What are the solutions? Well, I think there are two solutions. Number one, you got to keep the people happy that you have. And I read a wonderful story recently where they were talking about the importance of the exit interview. Right. And you guys have all done exit interviews. It's become part of sort of our sort of corporate culture in the United States. And this writer said, don't ever let it get to that point. Don't let it get to the point of an exit interview. You need to be doing retention interviews. You need to be talking about to your employees to figure out what is it going to take for me to keep the ones that I want to keep. So those retention interviews, I think, are part of the change in the corporate culture. Um, they're going to keep your people happy because people get big wage gains when they switch jobs. That's when it happens. So you want to keep people from switching jobs. That's the first thing. And the second thing is we have to do whatever it takes to embrace labor saving and labor augmenting technologies. And nobody likes to adopt new technologies. Michael, I don't like to get a new iPhone. And I'm pretty good age adjusted with technology. Um, even though, you know, I wear pink dresses, I can still manage a computer pretty decently. But even I don't like to switch phones. I don't like to deal with new technology because I'm going to spend some time having to learn it. Right. So people resist. They don't want to do the new stuff. And you have to make it as easy as possible and convince them that this is going to make your life better in the long run. And I believe those two things are, are the best suggestions I can possibly give on how do we run our businesses in this new environment that's not going to change. It's great advice, Marcy. Let's pivot now just to, to looking ahead uh, three, six, nine months out. I mean, where do you see the economy headed? Um, you know, maybe even touch more specifically on Q3, but then talk a little bit about the, the balance of year into next year outlook. Sure. Well, I would say three months ago, the recession talk kind of peaked right in June. And I think one of the reasons recession talk peaked in June is that consumer sentiment and people's satisfaction or dissatisfaction with the economy is highly tied to gasoline prices. So the price of the pump has a real um, um, emotional effect on people. So I've been calling it the emotional recession. Um, it's not a real recession because for a real recession to happen, you need consumer spending to decline. You need business investment to decline. For a real recession to happen, you have to have unemployment rates go up dramatically and people start losing their jobs. So you'd see an uptick in initial claims for unemployment benefits. We haven't seen any of those things. And so back in June, July of this year, it was amazing. I would talk to people, business people all the time. They'd say, oh, yeah, the economy is definitely in recession. Absolutely. And then I would say, well, how's your business? And they'd say, oh, it's gangbusters. Well, those two things can't be true. Everybody says their business is gangbusters, yet emotionally they look around and go, high gas prices, the economy must be terrible. Well, I think that talk probably peaked, like I said, in June, July. And we're now looking forward and realizing that we're going back to normal, that the disruptions from the pandemic by and large um, have faded into the background. All the stimulus faded into the background. People are going back to work, they're re-entering the labor force, and the trend rate of growth in the U.S. is 2%. That's what it is. So it's been a little below that, right? So last in the last quarter, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that GDP declined by 0.6%. 
And everybody said, oh, well, see, there's a recession. And my response is, it was all drawing, it was inventories. So whenever you draw down inventories, that can deliver you a negative GDP number. But if you look at consumer spending and you look at business investment, um, those two things have risen. The only component that has been hit pretty hard is the most interest rate sensitive component, and that is residential fixtures, building. So we are seeing the building sector take a real breather because the cost of money has gone up and they are still suffering from supply chain disruptions. So I expect the economy headed back to normal. Um, probably you'll get sort of a 1% GDP number in the third quarter. And then by the fourth quarter, expect it to go back to trend. And the stock market, even though it's been sort of a rough ride up and down and up and down and up and down, it looks as if it bottomed out in June. And the last couple of months, it's been like up and down, up and down, up and down. But it is up from its lows, which tells me, if you believe that's a forward looking indicator, that the U.S. economy is probably sort of looking forward in better positions, certainly than many of our international neighbors, where I'm expecting, um, you know, a pretty rough winter for um, Europe and Great Britain in particular, um, particularly after the terrible loss of their beloved queen. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. And Marcy, maybe ending our, on that note or closing on that note, you mentioned supply chain. I think we have a slide here um, oh, yeah. that maybe uh, kind of supports what you were just talking about. You can kind of take us through. Sure, exactly. Well, one of the things that I wanted to show everybody with this supply chain chart, and this is a relatively new index from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and it measures supply chain pressure. And this chart, they sort of calculated all the way back for 20 years. And you can see that it sort of bounces up and down, up and down and up and down. But you get to 2020, and of course, supply chain disruptions go off the charts. But they peaked in December of last year. And since that time, we are trending downwards, right? So those numbers are getting better. But the other reason I wanted to show everybody this chart is that when it comes to inflation, we now are in a position where we can see that about 40% of the surge in inflation over the last two years was accounted for by supply chain disruptions. Without those disruptions, inflation wouldn't have hit 9%. It would have only hit 6%. And you can say, well, why even 6%? And the 6%, sort of the bulk of the inflation, has come from the surge in demand during the pandemic era recovery that no one was anticipating, myself included. I wish I would have known that consumers were going to basically keep their jobs because of remote work, receive stimulus checks that were going to support their incomes, and because they weren't traveling and they were saving so much money and they weren't going out to eat, they went on a spending spree when it came to refrigerators, pools, jet skis, so many things that they bought. And so those two things together accounted for the surge in inflation. But we also know that going into next year, much of the fiscal stimulus um, that sort of hit people's bank accounts in 2020 and 2021 most of it has been spent. So the effect on consumers is certainly in the rearview mirror. And we can see that supply chains are slowly, but thankfully, returning to normal, which gets us back, quite frankly, to where we started, which is where does inflation go from here? And this is one of the main reasons why I believe that looking over into next year, inflation slowly returns to normal over the next two years. And we get back to where the economy was in 2019, which quite frankly was fairly boring. And I will take that. Hey, Marcy, we're going to end on that note. I can't tell you how much we appreciate having you here with us for these quarterly economic updates. Uh, I guess we'll, I'm, and it's wonderful that we're seeing a, a, you know, a little sun come through the clouds maybe with this, this latest update. Uh, and we're looking forward to having you back here in, I guess, 90 days or so in the town hall. So thank you again. Really appreciate the insights. Well, great. Marcy's always a, a difficult act to follow, but really do appreciate having her, ha, her, having her here with us today. But I uh, want to bring in uh, Mr. Ed Carl. Ed leads our, uh, the, the AICPA's uh, tax area. And it's great to have you here with us today, Ed. Welcome to today's town hall.
Thank, um, thank you, Michael. Yeah, great, great to be back, and uh, yeah, I enjoyed her talk, and so I'm, I'm okay to follow her. <laughs> it is a challenge. Well, Ed, I, I know we're kind of we're moving into uh, if there's a quiet period, there's you know this this period, you know the legislative outlook is it's kind of a quiet time that we're heading into. We're we're approaching midterms uh, and in lame duck session. Um, but there are a few things on the radar that I know you're following and the team, the advocates team in D.C. is following. So maybe take us through those. Well, quiet, a quiet period isn't so bad to have right now, Michael. We've, we've right. been on such a roller coaster over the last year or so. We, we've spoken about it, Barry and um, Mark Peterson and uh, Lauren Fingstad uh, talking about Washington updates and uh, uh, quite a bit about reconciliation bill, and I'll talk about the Inflation Reduction Act in, in just a few moments. But it's been a roller coaster ride, and we're enjoying a little bit of a, a lull here. Um, but there really is a lot going on under the surface during this lull for the um, midterm election cycle. So first things first, uh, we, we have the government's fiscal year ending September 30th. We need to have funding mechanism in place to fund the government for the next fiscal year. Now, normally that would be 12 appropriations bills plus the um, defense authorization. That is almost assuredly not gonna happen in this uh, election cycle. So in place of a full appropriations package, what we'll see is a continuing resolution or a CR. We've seen that very commonly the last couple of years. Um, and so we'll, we'll have that continuing resolution package. Um, what that does exactly is it continues the pre-existing appropriations at the same level, the same levels that has been approved for the current fiscal year. Now, does that mean that nothing else happens during that uh, period? Now, we're already seeing the posturing uh, discussions beneath the surface because a CR is one of the few mechanisms to move other legislation. And so there'll be conversations now, there are conversations going on about moving various uh, pieces of legislation that have been of interest to members of Congress. I think at the end of the day, they will move a fairly clean package. It does require 60 votes in the Senate. So that means that there has to be bipartisan support for the, um, the CR. Again, they're posturing conversations about moving pieces of legislation onto that CR. But at the end of the day, to get that bipartisan support, the 60 votes in the Senate, it's gonna to have to be a clean bill to move that. Now, there are other things going on. So you can see on the slide that there are other things being considered for the end of the year for the lame duck session, but the actual um, nature, the, the what and the when of um, the lame duck and and how it its scope what it will continue will really depend on the nature of the elections so again when i say by what and when the what meaning who controls each house uh uh the senate the house by what margins do they control the senate and the house and also something that we don't always think about but the ideological makeup of each chamber will be important uh, to what happens in the lame duck session. Also, when I say when, so we know we've seen the last couple of cycles that the final results of the election don't always um, become evident by the end of that night. So the end of the night of November 8th may not be conclusive. So. Will there be runoffs in some states and how close will uh, the results be? So really by the end of the night, uh, we may not know. So that will also have a large impact on what happens during the lame duck session. 
So some of the things that we're looking at and are important to, to our members, um, the perpetual one, tax extenders. So we, we've already had 40 some pro provisions expire at the end of 2021. There'll be another four or five that expire at the end of this year. Um, things such as from 2021, we already had, uh, for example, the enhanced child tax credit. Uh, one of our favorite topics to discuss in the town hall, the, the ERC, the employee retention credit, that, that expired. Um, some TCJA tax reform changes from several years ago, those expired last year. And the, the big one for expiring at the end of this year, the, the um, um, full expensing of um, business meals, that, that expires at the end of this year. The R&D credit also last year, a lot of businesses are wondering what's going to happen with that. Will it be... Um, uh, retroactively uh, changed to full expensing rather than uh, amortization. So those are some of the big discussions. Um, Marcy talked about um, supply chain disruptions. So there's uh, been a bill and in interest to um, provide relief to auto uh, dealers um, for um, LIFO changes. So with those supply chain disruptions, uh, businesses are eating into their LIFO layers and it's uh, created an enhanced uh, taxable income and causing problems. So there's some conversation about that. Likewise, conservation easements, there's been uh, a lot of talk of a deal to get legislation to um, sort of move some of the challenges that uh, we're seeing with conservation easements. And finally, I'll say about um, retirement legislation, SECURE Act 2.0. There have been various bills in the House and the Senate. There's not just one package. So I, I suspect that we'll see something in the retirement area, exactly what will, again, depend on um, what happens with the elections. Well, thanks, Ed. I know we'll track all this stuff. Our, our Washington team will track all this stuff closely through the, through the end of the year. And, and clearly, as any any information breaks or updates, uh, you know, are forthcoming. We'll be sure to include them into the town hall. So thank you for that. With that, I know we have a, a lot of technical updates for today's town hall. I want to go ahead and invite Lisa Simpson in. Uh, and Lisa, I'll pass the baton to you and Ed for this uh, this next session. Thank you, Michael. It's good to be back. I apologize for missing the last couple of sessions, but I was able to catch up on everything through the podcast. So if you're like me and have a severe case of FOMO, download those podcasts if you happen to miss one of our sessions live. Um, so Ed, thank you for agreeing to spend some time with me talking about tax. It is one week until September 15. I know that we've got a lot of people who are very busy cranking through um, the, the returns that they've got to finish up in the next two, four, six weeks. So I wanted to talk about some things that have been happening both on the advocacy side, but also a quick review of the, um, the recently passed legislation. So if we look at the um, Inflation Reduction Act on the, um, on the next slide, please, we've got some of the key provisions pulled out that um, we wanted to talk about. And one of the first ones that we wanna talk about is the corporate minimum tax. So on the next slide, we've got some details around that. And basically it's a minimum tax on, on certain very large corporations that goes into effect for tax years beginning after 1231-22. So Ed, what are your thoughts on, um, on that minimum tax issue? Well, you, you know, there are several of these items, some of the, the big items, the minimum tax, the excise tax, they apply to very large entities. I think the AMT, they're suggesting maybe 150 um, companies would be uh, pulled into that AMT. Uh, we, we oppose that. Um, the, the politics of finding revenue for this bill were so strong that it, it pulled, pulled this provision in. But it, it really is um, uh, so concerning to us as it overlaps with the um, financial rules 
that we've already formed a task force. It's been in place for uh, several weeks already to consider uh, offering um, feedback in advance of proposed regulations to Treasury and IRS. We, we normally wait for those proposed regs to come out before we comment. We're working on that right now to give them areas to influence what will be considered, what kind of guidance comes out. So that's critically important for us. And we're um, very uh, busy at work on that right now. That's that's great news because I know that, um, as you mentioned, there are some concerns about, we're always advocating for good fiscal policy and um, sound tax policy. So mixing in uh, gap accounting with tax with in taxable income is, is a challenge. The excise tax is also, I think, fairly targeted at large companies. So um, it's, a, it's basically for entities who are traded on an established market. There's some carve outs. Is there anything there that we need to dig into? Um, I, I think we'll pass on that. I think it's something that, uh, again, and we'll talk about um, information availability to members later. But uh, understanding what's there, certainly I think clients will be asking about it. Um, so some, having some familiarity with it is is important. Uh, and again, who it applies uh, to and who it doesn't apply to. Yeah, exactly. Is really the key right now? Yeah. Okay, that's a great point. Um, let's look at a couple of the other key tax provisions that we wanted to discuss, and we've got a continuation of some of the Affordable Care Act subsidiary, um, subsidies listed on the next page, and um, then also some of the um, energy and climate tax credit and incentives. There is a lot going on in this space, and we dug into some of it on the last town hall. So in the slides, we've given you a link to the previous town hall episode. Take a look at that if you want to, if you didn't catch that, or if you want to brush up on it. But again, there are provisions in there for individuals and for corporations, uh, new cars, used cars, all kinds of details in there. So we've yeah. actually given you um, a resource for ASCPA members around how to communicate with clients about that. And Ed, I think that's what you thought was most important was getting out in front and talking to your clients about some of those opportunities. Exactly. Just as we've said, the AMT and the excise tax apply to large entities. These um, tax cre credits and incentives are an opportunity for our members to get in front of their clients and um, give them uh, really good advice. Uh, the, these will apply to our, our members' clients, and it's, it's a, a good opportunity for them. And um, sneak peek, we've got a webcast that I'll, um, we've got a slide for that'll go into a lot of details um, around those credits. So uh, the next issue I wanted to talk about is the IRS funding. It's been all the, all the buzz um, since the legislation was passed and there's about $80 billion in there for the IRS. Um, and I know you've been looking at that and we actually released a statement around that. So quick thoughts on IRS funding levels? Yeah, we still hear about that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the backlog in a few minutes, but um, the, the funding is important for the um, tax administration. I, I look at this more as a strategic boost to them and something that we, we've been talking to the IRS about. Um, what did they do with the money? Several years ago, they had the Taxpayer First Act. It's called IRS next right now. And we're trying to give advice on where they spend their money. That is something that we will continue to talk to the IRS about, about what makes sense of where this money goes. Uh, I will say about um, the, the concern that um, a, a number of people have had about um, what happens with this funding and talking about arming agents Barry, it gave a strong statement about it two weeks ago. It's important to understand that having uh, uh, an appropriately funded tax administration system is important to all of us, to our clients, to our members, and, and that there are very, very few uh, IRS employees, about 2,000 out of the uh, 80,000 people 
um, special agents who are appropriately armed. So no concerns from our part and a very important statement to read. Thanks. And, and we've given you the link there. If that's something that you want to share with your clients potentially to um, help dispel any concerns about the, um, the funding levels. So I mentioned the webcast. I've looked at the slides. I did not get to um, listen in on the first um, go round on the, on the webcast, but I've seen the slides. I think they're going to be super helpful to you. And um, so you've got one coming up that you can catch on Tuesday, September 20th. Again, it's going to go through more of the details and especially those credits that we simply um, can't get into today. Um, we also have some other resources that I wanted to point out to you. We have a great Journal of Accountancy article that does a deeper dive into a lot of the provisions. There are some miscellaneous provisions that you're going to want to take a look at just to see if they apply to some of your clients. And a great tax section Odyssey podcasts. Uh, I love those podcasts. They're always really helpful, quick, 25 minutes, and they'll get you what you need to know. And then um, for our tech section members, you can get a summary of the Inflation Reduction Act. All of it's outlined in that Journal of Accountancy article, so you can catch it there. And then moving on, because I got back from a couple of days out of the office and my inbox was full of some advocacy letters that um, Ed, your team had been working on. So on the next slide, I wanted to talk first about a notice that came out just a couple of weeks ago, August 24th, that, you know, on the surface looks like really good news. I know it's something your team has been advocating for so much for the last two and a half years. So let's talk about what that notice provided but then what your suggestions are and where you think it's going to go. Yeah, it, 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 it's more than on the surface. It is really good news. Um, we've been advocating for penalty relief probably for about two years, uh, even broader than they allowed. Uh, our understanding is that they've been discussing this for quite a number of months. That's where the September 30th date came from. It also came from um, IT concerns. So for... IRS to be able to provide this relief, which is by and large automatic, they have to reprogram systems to, to look for taxpayers who may have had the penalty assessed and then to waive it or refund uh, in situations where they've already paid. They needed to have a clean break. They've been speaking about this uh, for, from our understanding for months and months. And so they picked September 30th as, as the, sort of the clean cutoff. Unfortunately, they didn't um, finalize this notice until the end of August. So that only gives us about five or six weeks till the end of uh, September. And obviously our members are really in the, the middle of the, the second busy season. And it's really, this is painful. So we, we've already submitted a letter asking for additional time. Uh, our letter asked till the end of December, we're, we're going to um, push for some more time. And my understanding, it's, it, I think that is possible, um, maybe not till the end of December, but we're going to have those conversations. The other thing that we're pushing for, a, a second letter is going to go in either later this afternoon or tomorrow, asking to broaden that relief. We've been asking for uh, relief from failure to pay as well. This is all about helping IRS dig out of the pandemic hole that they've been in, um, in terms of processing. Um, yes, the pandemic um, exacerbated this in a huge way. And what we want to do is minimize the need to contact the IRS, to send in letters, by eliminating these penalties, which will not give any kind of um, dividend to tax administration, it won't help. It's not helping anything. It will only make the backlog worse. And so we've been pushing for them to hold off for the time being. And this is a, a testament to the, the hard work that you guys have been doing in that advocacy effort. Another advocacy um, effort that you've been working on for quite some time is uh, the dreaded K2K3 that we show on the next slide. And I just want to um, level set for you guys. 
I have been following this K2K3 issue all year. Uh, I've read a lot. And um, when you read that comment letter, if you go into the analysis of each of these five bullets that we've pulled out here, whew, they're, they're complicated. Um, so we're not going to go through each of these five bullets. But um, Ed, we know from the comments over the past year how much need there is for simplification and clarity around who needs to file, um, which entities need to file K2K3. So of these five bullets, which one do you want to hit on the most? Yeah, let's talk about two. Um, what we've been having K2K3 conversations with IRS for about a year now. Uh, they made some uh, unexpected changes in, in January where they put out additional guidance and it, it, it sort of roped in a lot more taxpayers and having to file um, this, the schedules and it was unexpected. So there, there was an immediate pushback, uh, and a, a big outcry about that. And they did uh, backtrack a little bit and issued FAQ 15 on their website. And it talks about um, if uh, direct partners um, um, meet certain criteria, um, for example, no foreign activity and in, in the prior year, um, the domestic part partnerships or S-Corps um, uh, did not provide any type of uh, international related information to the partners or shareholders, then they could basically skip having to file this. And the, the biggest question we get is, will IRS extend that for next year and make it permanent? And that's a, a big thing, a big push. I, I expect after September 15th, when IRS is able to analyze the data and look at the filing experiences, that they really don't need too much information. They, it's important for them to get the data. It's important for them to see filing experiences. And I'm, I'm hopeful that they will make a decision to uh, keep FAQ 15 in place for next year after they analyze the, the current year data. That's great. So you're saying there's a chance. All right, um, let's move on to the next topic that you guys have been advocating around. And that is a um, question that popped up on a draft form 1040 in July. And so we've given you the language that um, Carrie Hipsack presented back to you in July around what the question around virtual currency used to look like 2020, 2021, um, there were some questions about it, but all in all, um, simpler than what we got on the 2022 draft. So if you look at the wording there, um, at any time during 2022, did you receive as a reward an award or compensation, or did you sell, exchange, gift, otherwise dispose of a digital asset or a financial interest in a digital asset? That's completely different than the question that was asked on 2020 and 2021 returns. So Ed, you, you sent in um, a letter to the IRS requesting some clarity on that. And um, we've got some of those bullet points on the next slide for you. And also a link to a, a great Journal of Accountancy article that goes into some of the details around there. But if we look at all of these, which one do you hear the most about as causing concern from, from our partners. Yeah, um, you know, n number five is the item that we're looking at quite uh, strongly. Uh, obviously, virtual currency is, is a, a hugely impactful um, and growing area for everybody, including the IRS and, and, the, and the importance for um, voluntary compliance. So it's understandable that they would look to improve compliance in this area. But we've been asking this question for several years. The, the question is not new, it's changed again, um, anticipating, it changed again for this year and we're looking to what it will be for next year. But we're looking to get sort of much like we talked about K2, K3, if you don't really get any benefit by filing K2, K3, why do it? Same thing. What do you get by answering this question? Yes. And we don't know. We, we don't know what they're going to do with the data. We don't know what the ramifications of answering yes. 
And so our, our position is where answering no is not going to hurt the system, let's get as many people as possible answering no. So for example, if you have a child or another other dependent, you claim on the return, um, you don't want to uh, require a yes answer. You want to get to no um, if your dependent has some kind of uh, virtual currency investment. Similarly, if you receive virtual currency as a gift, what kind of taxable event is there? Why, why would you worry about that? You want to get to know other places, uh, donating uh, virtual currency to a charitable organization. You want to get to know, and that's, that's what we want to do is get as many taxpayers safely to know. Okay. So more to come on that and, and hopefully we'll get some, um, some clarity before the, the filing season begins. Um, very quickly, we've got a webcast coming up on um, supporting your clients with crypto transactions. It's pretty complex to keep track of all that basis. So we have some resource opportunities for you. Now I want to move to um, a, another topic that's been really important. So IRS backlog, let's talk about that for just a minute, because I want to spend another minute or two talking about um, aggressive ERC firm. So we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about what the backlog is and is there is there any progress, but Ed, are we hearing that there's any progress? And yeah, the I, I think there work? is progress. The real question is where will they be at the end of this year? We've been pushing them to get to healthy levels. And um, I mean, healthy level is what the commissioner promised to the oversight subcommittees at the beginning of the year. We're trying to even get a definition of healthy. We, we think that's basically pre-pandemic inventory levels. IRS will always have inventory of work. They're not going to finish everything at, at the end of any day. So there's inventory. Question is, what, what should that inventory be? My understanding in speaking to people is, well, number one, I don't think they would have issued that notice 2022-36 unless they thought they needed it to help to get to um, uh, healthy levels. And we've been pushing them because we didn't think they could get there without it. So I think that is a good step and a good sign. Um, my understanding is they believe it will help significantly. Will it get to that healthy level? That I can't promise, but we're gonna continue to have that dialogue to try to, to get there. So Ed, I don't know about you, but I get at least, um, five emails a week talking about aggressive ERC firms. And so I, I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to talk about it today because I know this is causing so much um, frustration and concern with, with our practitioners because their clients are getting um, hit with what seem to be too good to be true opportunities to claim ERC. And I know that your teams have been talking to the IRS about it. We've talked to Congress about it. So I just want to let everyone on the call know that that we, the IRS knows about these aggressive ERC firms. They know that there are um, returns being filed that are taking ERC where, where it's probably not warranted. It's my understanding in talking with Ed that they're going to go, they're beginning their audits of ERC already. And yeah. they're going to have lots of data to look at so that they can target by industry, as an example, just like they did with PPP forgiveness audits. Yeah, the American Rescue Plan gave uh, an enhanced, uh, elongated uh, statute of limitations to give them time to look at this. You know, just like PPP, it was trying to move quickly. Now with ERC, they didn't move so quickly, and we know that. But they, there is an enhanced statute of limitations for them to dig into. We've had some serious conversation of, of, about these aggressive firms, um, some of the inappropriate things we're hearing. And, and I, I wouldn't be shocked to see some news over the coming weeks. Perfect. And our team is working on some um, sample communications that you can use to send to clients to talk about some of the, the challenges and the, and the concerns about filing ERC. Um, really quickly, I want to talk about uh, student debt forgiveness that came out right um, as or after the last town hall. So I just wanted to point you to the, the basics and to call out something that you might want to be thinking about with your clients if they 
are employed by a nonprofit, military, federal, state, tribal, local, they may be eligible for additional forgiveness, but that expires on October 31, 2022. So make sure that you um, take a look at that. Uh, canceled student debt forgiveness is not taxable under the American Rescue Plan, but there might be some state tax implications. There is a chart that the um, tax section has created and they've um, that'll be open for the next two weeks that lets you look at by state um, the taxability or exclusion of that. So with that, I'll bring up Michael and um, we'll get to our, our closing segment. Thank you, Lisa and Ed. Uh, really tight uh, for questions, but I do just want to express the appreciation of uh, all of our attendees for all the great content that both you and your teams are uh, are turning out. People are really appreciative of helping them kind of make sense. I know there's a lot of things that will continue to remain uncertain, but there's a lot of appreciation for all the great resources that are putting P out. So big thank you to both of you. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, in, in summary, real quick, uh, you know, just want, you know, we heard from uh, Marcy Russell today. I mean, clearly, uh, you know, Marcy's sentiments were that things were beginning to turn and, and, and look a bit up. Uh, I'm sure we have a number of months of uncertainty between now and the end of the year, but we'll all navigate that together and make sense of it together. Um, again, we're going into what we expect to be is a fairly light legislative agenda over the next few months, but the advocacy team will continue to monitor and share updates as they are needed and become become available. Uh, and then we just took you through a whole host of things in the tax area that we'll again continue to stay on top of uh, and update you with each of these each of these town halls. Uh, with that, I just want to remind everybody again that all of these town halls are archived. So in case you need to refer back or have missed anything, um, we have a YouTube channel uh, that you can access them. You can access them through. Uh, today's resources on the slide deck. So uh, please go back and refer to them uh, if there's anything you missed or you want to go a little bit deeper on. Um, our next town hall will be Thursday, September 22nd. We just wanted to highlight our one of our guest speakers, Nancy Giordano. Nancy has written a multiple, you know, number of books on everything from leadership to uh, kind of the future in focus, uh, she's a strategic futurist, so we're gonna we're really excited to have her with us and kind of maybe look into uh, the months and years ahead, at least according to Nancy. And so uh, you're not gonna want to miss uh, that uh, that September 22nd edition. Uh, well, Lisa, I want to invite you. I know we have a couple of slides here. Um, yeah. Um, so just to make sure that everyone knows. You've, you've hopefully gone, gotten a lot closer to us over the last couple of years. And, and so we wanted to make sure that you knew about all of the volunteer opportunities that there are available to you as an AICPA member. The application window closes October 1, but we have over 2,000 volunteers who, who work with us on a um, regular basis. So you can, you can look at the opportunities there by clicking on that link. And then I wanted to highlight a, a session an event that we have coming up in October that is focused on um, the accounting pipeline. This particular event is focused on diversity. In our, on our October 6th epi uh, episode of the Town Hall, Sue Coffey and Mike Decker will be joining us to talk about uh, the broader accounting pipeline, what's going on with the CPA exam, and some things that firms are doing to broaden the pipeline. Thank you, Lisa. And, and our volunteer membership uh, is legendary and their contributions are, are uh, highly regarded and welcome. So it's a, it's a great call out. Um, uh, again, the town hall newsletter, if you haven't subscribed already, please do at cpa.com forward slash town hall. We'll give you uh, weekly updates, both pre and post uh, town hall. Um, again, a reminder, our next, uh, next town hall is on September 22nd. We are going to have a special edition town hall, however, on September 29th. It won't be the traditional town hall as far as content. It is going to be a, a deep dive into technology. So it'll be a focus on tech. Uh, again, a really, uh, we're going to have a number of guest speakers talking about technology and how it's impacting the profession. Uh, so it's, uh, it'll be a very, very insightful uh, special edition town hall. So please do mark your calendars for that. And with that, I just want to thank everyone again for being with us here today. I want to thank Ed and Lisa 
for uh, for a great great uh, addition, and we look forward to seeing everybody back here on Thursday, September twenty second. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.